Farahani, and as the director of the Duke Initiative for Science and Society, it is my great pleasure to, to welcome you this evening to our distinguished speaker series and to welcome you for our distinguished guests who are joining us this evening. We are truly honored this evening to have with us uh, both President Broadhead, who will be introducing our extraordinary guest, President Rabo Freeman Rabowski, who will be speaking with us this evening on the topic of minorities in STEM empowering the next generation. The Duke Initiative for Science and Society is a campus-wide initiative that offers educational opportunities, including an undergraduate certificate program, the Wyatt Fellowship Program, an MA in Bioethics and Science Policy, opportunities for engagement, including our signature programs on communicating science, tracking science policy and legislation, and serving as a MIKI in key cases. We also generate new research on the intersection of science, law, and policy, such as our SLAP Lab program. This evening, we are truly delighted that you're joining us for the second of our three distinguished speaker events this, e this, this year. Our distinguished speaker series brings the most notable individuals in science, law, and policy to engage with our diverse community on how science impacts society and how we might better address the ethical, legal, social and cultural implications of science. On March 22nd, we will also be hosting New York Times science writer, Gina Collada, and we hope you'll join us then as well. We're particularly grateful to the Office of the Provost and Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Studies, who serve as co-sponsors for this evening. And we're honored to have President Broadhead here to introduce our distinguished guest, President Freeman Rabowski, who's a true exemplar of our mission at Science and Society, maximizing the social benefit from scientific progress by making science more accessible, just, and better integrated into society. These two presidents have much in common, not the least of which is that they each hold an honorary degree from the other's respective educational institutions. <laughs> Here at Duke, of course, President Broadhead requires no further introduction, and he will reflect and share with us some of the extraordinary accomplishments of our speaker this evening. Immediately following President Rabowski's remarks, we'll have a moderated question and answer session, followed by a reception in the atrium where, you, where we hope that we'll continue the conversation. Would you please join me in welcoming these two extraordinary university presidents, President Broadhead and President Rabowski.
this guy was born in Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama in 1915. So you know he was born not just in a segregated state, but in what was really almost like ground zero of segregation in America. Uh, you know that, or perhaps you know, I just consider it completely amazing, uh, during the Civil Rights Movement, there was an especially powerful, never to be forgotten moment in which children marched in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, and you had this showdown, this sort of iconic showdown of the innocent, the faces of innocence in children and the faces of repression in the police force of that city. One of the children in that march was Raymond Bernowski, and I was, you spent days in jail after that, what, when you were 12, 13? Not good. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the notion, like, you know, people would still invite you to speak if that's the last interesting thing you ever did, but actually that was just an event of your childhood, on your way to do what? You went on to higher education, you chose one of the really easy subjects to study, mathematics. Uh, you trained as a mathematician, you went on, you got a master's, you got a PhD, uh, and then what I find amazing, since the, there's no unremarkable chapter in the life of Frank Turowski as far as I can tell, uh, but by the time you were still in your young 40s, you were handed the presidency of a university, uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and during that time, you took a school which few people had heard of and made it a school that everyone has heard of. Uh, a school that everyone has heard of because you actually took something that was a kind of a, let's be frank, not first year, mostly commuter university, and you elevated it into a formidable research university, formidable across all the array of departments in the university. I have friends who teach the humanities there, so I know about this. You've made it an engine of opportunity economically, uh, uh, culturally for the city of Baltimore. You've made it a, res a, 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 a new kind of resource uh, that it wasn't before, and indeed, it is also the home of what remains the most successful and most remarkable program attracting underrepresented minorities to, uh, 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 inspiring them to and sustaining them in the advancement toward careers in uh, subjects found very difficult by some, by, by some of us, especially in the field of, of, of science and engineering. Every outstanding uh, uh, graduate and professional school in America uh, part of the way you know it's outstanding is that it has Meyerhoff scholars among its uh, 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 medical students, its graduate students, and among its alumni body. Uh, you know, uh, when David Tweedy came out from, uh, from a member of our own faculty in psychiatry this year, a uh, black man in a white coat, guess what? He was a Meyerhoff, he, got, he, he went to medical school at Duke, but he went to undergraduate school at UMBC. Uh, when I heard that Ka uh, Jirowski had been chosen as a president's early career, do I have this right, uh, uh, award winner? I'm so proud, he's at Duke. Guess what, he also went to medical school here. And guess what, he also started out at uh, UMBC. Uh, so if you're looking for a place that has actually found a way to take talent, to attract it, to inspire it, and to put it on the road to fulfillment of promise in a way that gratifies individuals and meets a social need, you're gonna find it at UMBC. I just want to tell you, uh, I could, I could uh, if you, uh, I, I mean, I've got the information, if you insist, I will do this. I could recite all the honors uh, that have been accorded to Freeman Hrabowski. It's a somewhat tedious list, if you'll pardon my saying so. Kind of like uh, me. The Carnegie uh, uh, Foundation has recognized you with its highest medal. Uh, you have led a National Academies Commission on uh, the subject that we will be talking about today. You have honorary degrees from all the most famous universities, certainly including Duke. Uh, but I learned recently from the writer David Brooks that there's a distinction to be made between what he calls resume virtues and what he calls epitaph virtues or eulogy virtues. Uh, the, th the things we talk about that are the impressive facts about a person and the things that are impressive about that person. Uh, I'm gonna go light on your resume virtues. Anyone can look them up, they're all available online. I'm gonna give a eulogy virtue far before, uh, you know, when you still have at least 80 years of prime ahead of you. I went, uh, and you were given an honorary degree at Duke, my first year at Duke. Uh, that's what I learned not only about you, but really there were a, a huge table, you know, everybody in medical school had been sucked out of the school to go uh, dote on you uh, on that occasion, many of them your, form, your former students. The next year I was offered an honorary degree at your school, and I went there, and here's what I remember. What I remember is that the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, recognizing that I was a humanist, had actually produced, a, a, a behind the place where we had lunch, an exhibit of all the recent books
by humanities faculty at your university, and you'd invited several of them to have lunch with me. Uh, what a, what, how, how pleasant for me, and what an honor for them. That was great. After lunch, you took me on a tour of labs. Do you remember the labs in which uh, your undergraduates, the Meyerhoff scholars, were doing, uh, uh, were, were parts of lab teams. The fact that you knew who every faculty member was, the fact that you knew who every student was, that is not actually true of every president of American University. <laughs> the sad truth spoken, uh, but it was, true, uh, it was true of you, and what I will say, when the time came, when I attended the commencement, how many students did you graduate last year? 2,000. But it's the kind of graduation where everyone got to come on stage and shake hands. You know why? Because it's the kind of place where a great many people crossing the stage are the first in their family. They are the hopes of their family to get this education. When you go to a graduation at UMBC, you see everybody from everywhere. You see all God's people, people from every part of American society, every part of immigrant society. They're all there. They're there because they're smart. They're there because they're hungry for education. They're not there because they've had advantages. Perhaps some have, many haven't. You see education as the road of democracy, the, the, uh, the, the means for everyone to get the means that will enable them to live up to their power. Uh, uh, at this late date, I have a further thing I could boast about, which is I am a friend of Freeman Probowski. Uh, please join me in welcoming him. Others are in grad school, and I just met with others who are not here tonight. 
My campus has students from 150 countries. And what is fascinating is that these students are aspiring to be leaders in different disciplines. And the one thing I think about, and I say this to colleagues, is that many students come to college with an interest and with dreams to be doctors or lawyers or teachers or scientists. And one of the questions I think we need to ask ourselves, whether someone's coming to med school or or be a scientist or an engineer is, what is that student's chance of actually fulfilling his or her dream? The research says that large numbers of people in our country who begin with an interest, particularly in science and engineering, do not, do not find success in science and engineering. And I'll talk about the study that I chaired for the National Academy of Sciences. But I actually begin with a story. You know, I say that Baltimore is the upper south. The upper <laughs> south. One day we think like people in Philadelphia, the next day we think like people in Richmond. It depends on the issue. I would call you the south. You know, although we think of Duke as kind of a bastion of, of liberal thought in many ways, interestingly. Uh, but I come from the deep south, Birmingham. The deep south. Make no mistake about it. Why do I tell you that? Um, I grew up, as Dick was saying, within the civil rights movement, and my experiences as a child shaped my worldview, obviously, and my thinking about becoming an educator, a mathematician, and someone to prepare people in science. As we think about science and society, clearly the experiences we have when we're young often have more of an influence on us than we might have. The, the book that I recently wrote, entitled Holding Fast to Dream, has a subtitle, which is Empowering Youth from the Civil Rights Crusade to STEM Achievement. And the book is the result of several lectures that I gave in Boston for institutions there, higher institutions and K-12 people, uh, answering the question, what led you to this interest in producing scientists of color and others. And I found myself struggling with some of the questions simply because I had not thought about some of the experiences I had. I was sitting in the back of church when I was 12 in 1963, and the man at the lectern said, if the children participate in this peaceful march, all of America will understand that even our babies know the difference between right and wrong. And, and they'll be able to get a better education. And the only thing I could think about was that I was so tired of those hand-me-down books from the white school, which they would give us after the white kids finished with them. And uh, I'll never forget looking up and saying, who is this guy? I did not want to be there. Who the kid wants to be in church in the middle of the week? <laughs> My parents had bribed me with the two things I loved most, eating and mathematics. So I was eating M&Ms, the good kind, the peanuts. <laughs> getting fatter and smarter all the time. And I look up, and there is this guy. And I said, who is this guy? And they say, of course, his name is Martin Luther King. And I begin to listen, and I found myself believing for the first time that tomorrow could be different from today. That I, as a child, could have some impact on my own future. And so I went home and I said to my parents, I want to march. I want to be a part of this. And they said, of course, absolutely not. <laughs> to which I responded, you guys are hypocrites. Now, at that time, students, you did not tell your parents they were hypocrites. All right? Uh, go to your room, boy. The next day they came in the next morning and they had not slept. And what they said was this. It was not that we didn't trust you. We did not trust did not trust the people who would be holding you in jail. Because if you march, you're going to jail. And the reason we were going to jail was that the city would not give the civil rights leaders a permit to march. You see. Now, why is that important? They had a conversation with me which led to our agreeing I would go. My students always say, you must have been a brave kid at 12. I was not a brave kid. In fact, the only thing I ever attacked in my life was a math problem. Get that? If there was a fight, I was running the other way. What I did know was that I wanted a better education. The other part, though, 
when you think about science and society, is this. I always, from that point on, connected solving math problems with solving the problems of society. I always did. And what I found fascinating was that often the most interesting problems could not be solved quickly. And later, when my mother, the English teacher, became a math specialist, anybody remember anything called the new math? Anybody old enough the new math? Some of the older people in the gray. Uh, the reason the new math failed was that we in universities did not go into the K-12 as partners. We just went to tell them what to do, and we frightened teachers even more in many cases. But my mother went back to become a math specialist. So she was an English specialist and a math specialist, and I was her guinea pig. And so I was learning poetry and literature at the same time that I was learning word problems, because what she came to understand as an English teacher who became a math teacher was this. The better a child can read, the better the child can think. And the better the child can think, the greater the facility with which the child can attack a word problem. Because we don't discuss or attack chemistry or physics or math or engineering or problems in medicine using numbers. We discuss problems in the social sciences or the relative science in words. And to solve problems, one must be able to read and think well. So she was working to figure out how you connect the reading, the thinking, and the math. Right? So I'm working on that all the time. I'm working in the civil rights period. I spend a week in jail, a terrible week. But what it taught me was this, that even children can be empowered to have an impact on their own future and can be enticed into a community that talks about the nobility of the work itself. That we were doing this for a special reason. I'll never forget trying to encourage the kids not to be so upset in the jail. And I'll never forget one evening when our parents were outside of the jail. And Dr. King said this, what you do this day will have an impact on children yet unborn. And we didn't understand the profundity, but somehow we knew that we needed to keep thinking about that idea, that the world might be different. Now, within a matter of months, what we saw was legislation after the March on Washington. Within a matter of months, in 1964, you had the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Higher Education Act. And as a result, America was changed dramatically. How do I know that? What percent of Americans do you think in 1963 had actually completed college? What would you think? Anybody in the audience? I heard 12%. Somebody else? 16? And don't let me leave Duke saying you're risk adverse. <laughs> Five. Anybody else? Come on. 30? It was only 10%. 10% of Americans in the mid 60s had a college degree. Most people did that. How many of you knew that? Only 10%. Now, let's break it down to black and white. At that time, people did not have different groups, racial groups. Everything was black and white. In fact, I can prove it to you. Watch this. Watch this. How many people in the room remember TV that was black and white? How many of you have always had color TV? That's disgusting. Yes. <laughs> but I want the president to see this. This is what I learned that was so fascinating. How many of you were not even born yet in 1963? There is the disgusting piece. <laughs> what am I saying? I am telling you this, that, that most of you are hearing me talk in the same way that I could be talking about something from 100 years before, because you've read about these times, but you would not have been there. But the world is so dramatically different. And one of the points is that at that time, blacks had a certain percent in college, whites. What percent of whites do you think had graduated from college? What would you think? What percent? Ten. We said 10 for the entire country. So what percent of whites? Now, as a math person, you know if, if it's 10% for the country, whites are more men, right? We know that, right? Right? 
Gotta be more than 10. It's only 11%. And for blacks? It's only 2. 2%. Okay. Now, today we break into other racial groups, and we'll get to science, but you need to get a sense of how different the world is. So, what percent today of Americans have a college degree? It's family to 30%. What percent of whites? It's about 37, 38% percent of blacks. It's up to about 21% percent of, of Asians. I usually get a 90 from somebody. <laughs>
when thinking about power in science in our country, it still is primarily in the hands of white men. That is not a negative statement or a positive statement. It is simply the truth. Look at the National Academy of Science. This is my friend, Mike Summers, who's spoken here. He speaks highly of Duke. And he's a Howard Hughes investigator. He's probably one of the leading, not probably, he is one of the leading producers of African Americans who, and others who go on to get PhDs in science. I was telling, and amazingly, one of his students of color just got, got a PhD from him, postdoc, just got tenure at Harvard in biochemistry. Give my summers a round of applause, all right? <laughs> And then I've got a young black Mark Hawk scholar, a young black male, and then one of my Korean immigrants, uh, who's a wonderful young woman, an American, uh, and they're all studying HIV. Why? It goes back to something that we were talking about before, the problems of humankind. That the dream should be that students of all races, people of all races, are getting to know each other well enough, trusting each other enough, and developing the skills and the competence to know what's necessary to study the problems of humankind, whether in science from the point of view of biochemistry or from the point of view of psychology or from the social sciences. How do we prepare students who will have the interest in helping with these issues and have the skills that they need, the thinking skills that they need? Now, here is the challenge. The National Academy of Sciences study that I conducted was asked for by Senators Kennedy and Clinton and uh, Mikulski, because the rising above the gathering storm report was a wonderful report, but it only had about two pages on the issue of demographics in our country. And the big question was this. If we know that half the babies born in America as of two or three years ago are not white, what will be the impact of this growing diversity in our population on what happens to competitiveness, particularly regarding STEM? And if we look at the data, what you'll see is this. Whether we're talking about producing PhDs in science, or, or physicians, or people in any science related area, or engineering, the fact is that only 5% of the American bachelor's degrees are given in natural sciences and engineering. If you look at the data from the National Science Foundation, they will talk about science and engineering, but they will include the social sciences. If you take the social sciences away, and you look at natural sciences in this year where you have a real challenge, what you'll see is it's only 5% of the degrees. In Europe, it's almost 11%. India is in the process of creating 800 additional universities. 800 additional universities. Here's the other point, really critical issue. For minorities, black, Hispanic, others, the percentage is between two and three. And so the first response from the professoriate is go to K through 12. It's a K through 12 problem. That's what we say in universities. The challenge I would ask, I would say provocatively, is that we in the American society are accustomed to pointing fingers. So universities blame high schools, who blame middle schools, who blame elementary schools, who blame the family, and the husband blames the mother side of the family. <laughs> <laughs> it's all over again, all right? But when we looked at the data, this is what we found, and this is what's really sensitive. Um, what do we call the first year of science in universities? In engineering, weed out courses. And here is what's stunning. I, if you haven't looked at my TED talk on changing the culture of science, it either gets people upset or they say, yeah, he's right. One way or the other. You're never a neutral about it. But it says this. Um, the data will tell you this. The higher the SATs of students, the larger the number of AP credits, the more prestigious the university the student attends, the greater the probability the student will leave science or engineering within the first year or two. So, quite frankly, and my joke is, everybody who starts off in pre-med becomes a great lawyer. <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is that the, the subjects that are quantitatively based are unpredictable when coming to testing. Think about it. You get five problems, three you've seen before, two you've not seen before, and if you don't have enough time, you don't do well, and you get a C or a D. Now, the advantage, quite frankly, for med school, and I'm going to give Duke the credit, Duke has done well for blacks in going to med school. You're in the top five. Give yourself a hand. It's very impressive. You've not done well in producing the kids who go for PhDs at the undergrad level or on, but you've done well at this. And the, and the reason is, the reason is this, that
that um, uh, for the prestigious universities, a lot of students, and you know this, most students will not complete a science degree. They take enough science to do well on the MCAT. This is what the data shows. They do well on the MCAT because they've done well on the SAT. But they get a major in something where their grades can be better and then they can go to med school. But they're not becoming PhDs in science. Where you've done well is in the grad program. Duke does well. I enjoy it. I want to say this to you. I came to say to the president and others, you do a good job with students who come into grad school. I mean, you, my students say that they get the support they need. And so give yourselves a hand by helping students who come from other places in grad school. <laughs> but this is my challenge to you as I challenged MIT last week. You attract some of the best students of all races in the country. I would say to Duke, you should be among those institutions producing students who are doing well enough in science and engineering to go on to PhDs in science and engineering. And right now, you are not. Uh, and the other question is, what makes the difference for us? What we have found is not just about the model program and building community and those things. It's also about rethinking the teaching and learning process and innovation. If you look at the UMBC Chemistry Discovery Center, we've gotten a lot of awards for what we're doing. It is about rethinking whether lecturing is the best approach for students today in first year and second year science. It is about the use of technology, group work. Um, we use problems out of our biotech companies. We have over 100 companies on campus, biotech and IT companies. It's out of our faculty and Hopkins faculty. It's about opportunities for professional development, interdisciplinarity, and much more emphasis on teaching students how to connect the research to the teaching earlier, and having higher expectations for ourselves. And quite frankly, making it very clear we can be better than success is never, success is never final. So I would say we're doing well, but we can be even better. I will tell you this, we now lead the country in producing not just students of color, but the key is this, when you're able to help one group like students of color, you help students in general. There's the point that's key, because it's not just black students who are not doing well in science and engineering. Largest numbers of white, and it, in fact, what percent of white students do you think who started in science and engineering actually complete a bachelor's in science and engineering? Take a guess. It's only 31%. And for Asians, what do you think it is? It's only 40%. And this is among well-prepared students. So the big secret in America is that even when you've done well in high school with fives and your perfect SATs, your probability of making it is much lower than you might think it is when you go to college. And there is the challenge that we face in our country that I think is a, a, a major question about our society, because here is the fundamental point. We need more people in these areas, but the question is about the attitude about science. How many of you in this room knew you were a math science type or a history English arts type by the time you were in the 11th grade? How many of you had a great experience in science in undergrad school? You're a pretty nice dirty group, very good. Uh, <laughs> all right. How many of you know people who did not have a good experience in science in undergrad school? And, and there is my point to the National Institutes of Health, to the National Science Foundation, and to the research community. If the majority of Americans did not have a good experience while they were in school, why should we expect them to support research funding and funding for science in Congress? So I leave you with this thought. The Chesapeake Bay Retriever is our mascot. And his name is True Grit. And we say that UMBC is the house of grit. All right? And what we are pushing in the country is that we should stop talking about these students as smart and these students as not smart. It's not about smart. I have, I have students. I have a Young Scholars program for children as young as nine. I'll get students to the calculus sequence when they're 12 and 13, but we don't tell them they're smart. It's about grit. It's about the hard work, the resilience, looking in the mirror, learning how to get back up when you get knocked down, working in groups, and the connecting between faculty and students that can make all the difference in the world. I started by talking about dreams. 
I never could have imagined that this week I had a call, Dr. Brodin, from uh, one of my students saying that he's gotten one of these White House Early Career Awards. It is a remarkable achievement for your institution, for ours, for, for his. And so I want Kopp to stand. I am so proud of him. Kopp, <laughs> Here's the point. 
you've got all these people who said they started college, they, and then they're in worse shape. And then if you look at the books on inequality, uh, the for-profit institutions have devastated the poor class. I mean, because they start college, they pay all these big prices, and they don't get a degree because they drunk out, and then they owe more money than ever. So you've got this widening of this gap between those who have and those who don't, and it's pretty bad, it really is. And we're not addressing that inequality issue. I mean, it is abs and it's harder to get a job if you don't have some skills, okay? And the worse off you are, the harder it is to get out of that hole. That's a real issue. And what I would say to grad students in the room and undergrads, I mean, part of our challenge is to think through what your future will hold. If you were to ask me the greatest challenge for those of you in grad school in science and engineering, it is that the academy has not thought through how to give you support in your careers. Two reports, one by Shirley Tillman on the future of biomedical research careers and the other pathways to careers from the Council of Grad Schools, both say that universities have a greater responsibility to help grad students, masters and PhD students in STEM areas to think through in the same way that medical schools think through residencies for students, uh, more so than we have done. And I've said this before, um, particularly for women and minorities, it is really challenging if there isn't somebody who's not, as my students were saying today, not just a mentor, but a sponsor who helps to connect the student to the opportunity. It is critical that we have universities thinking about what they will do to help students at the next level. Very important. Next question. Uh, I teach high school uh, at a STEM high school. Yes. What can we do to inoculate our STEM interested students against the weed out classes that they will face in college? That's a great question. It really is. It really is. First thing you can do is to ask the university how students from your campus, from your high school, have done when they came to your institution. One of the things we do is to give people feedback on students from that school about the rigor of the work, if they've had calculus in high school or whatever, how have students done, have gotten B's and B's, you know. Very important, really is. And then the other point that's very important is to prepare students to work in groups. What we know that makes the difference in STEM work is community. Very important for students to learn to work in groups. A lot of institutions have the posse programs. I, I have found around the country that the places that have replicated my offer, uh, both Chapel Hill and Penn State are replicating my offer right now, a big grant from Howard Hughes. And the emphasis is on community. It takes researchers to produce researchers. You want to know who the faculty are who are going to be involved in supporting those students? Very important. Faculty are at the core. Any, and it means culture change. If you get a chance, there's a piece that my colleagues and I wrote on a theory of change for the university people here on the social transformation theory of change that we wrote several years ago about empowering minority students on the campus. But the, the lessons that we learn from minority students are true for white students also. It's about that sense of community, um, basing that on giving them a role, the, the importance of, of tutoring, of working in groups, and of talking about the challenges they face, both academic challenges and other challenges. Because kids are never, students are never just thinking about their academic work. They have other problems involving family and boyfriends and girlfriends. And it's the whole person that we have to think about. Too often, we don't think about the whole person. The same thing was true, by the way, for the women faculty when we looked at our advanced program. I was the PI on our advanced grant. People were surprised. And I said I wanted to be the PI because men should be as concerned about the paucity of of, the, of women in, in science and engineering as anybody. Just as whites should be as concerned about the cost of minorities. Because these are American issues, right? We've got to be these things together. It's very important. Okay. Yes, 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 sir. should be involved with K-12 in programs 
designed to help those children learn to read well, be excited about reading. Any child who's going to do well in STEM has to learn to read and to enjoy reading. We don't say that enough. We have a tendency to separate arts and humanities from science and engineering. And we have to find ways of showing connection across disciplines. There's so many connections that can be found. And kids enjoy those connections. So we do a lot with children, even with, I mean, one of the reasons we're called innovative is we're doing things, we have 500 first time offenders, little boys of color mainly, that we work with. I mean, we've been doing it now 25 years, but we supervise them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we're teaching these children not only to read and word problems, but the arts. And we work, I mean, literally helping them with STEM work, but, but we're working with them and the police in very difficult areas using the arts in restorative circles to prepare them for those days when you have things like the Freddie Gray situation at home. So there are ways of connecting the arts and humanities with reading and thinking with issues involving math and science that can help you with challenges in, in critical areas of city. Chancellor Scholars kids. Can you stand up with your Chancellor Scholars kids? I'm really proud of you. Because he just said, I just need to talk it through. 
I want you to always remember you can talk it through and it will push you to be better than you ever thought you could be. Each of you will change the world. So I want everybody to understand, we're going to do what we do in my office, we're going to do this poem together. It's the Mason Hughes poem. Get up, everybody, in the name of poetry. Repeat after me, and when you finish it, I want you to, you got to do what we do in my office. You're going to go focus, focus, focus. You got it? Right? Okay, as I say out loud, you repeat it. And students, I want you to dream about the possibilities. Here we go. Hold fast to dreams. Hold fast. Or if dreams die, dreams die. Life is a broken winged bird. That cannot fly. fly. Hold fast to dreams. Dream. For when dreams go, dream life is a barren field, a barren field. Frozen, with frozen with snow. Focus, focus, focus. Dream on, bro. Dream on. Thank you all.